Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ed Beardsley. I am the managing director of Fine and Decorative Arts here at Heritage Auction Galleries. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here this evening for our second Tuesday's lecture. Uh, here in the auction business, we come across a lot of treasures. Everybody likes to hear about treasures. And uh, we're delighted that uh, Mark Prendergast has put together a treasure full uh, lecture tonight. You're going to see a lot of great fun images and hear a lot of great stories about the auction business. Uh, we are broadcasting the lecture on our website under HA Live, so uh, you uh, people at home can be viewing it at the same time as the lecture, and we will also post it on the website uh, in a few weeks so that you can look at past lectures um, and, uh, and future lectures in, in this way. But we love having you here. Uh, Mark Prendergast is our Director of Business Development down in Houston, Texas. Also director of trust and estate, so he wears a lot of hats, uh, comes up to Dallas quite often and travels and sees a lot of uh, what goes on in the auction business. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Prendergast, who will uh, tell us some exciting stories tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you Ed. All right, just testing the microphone. Everybody can hear me? Yeah, great. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, welcome to Heritage um, Fine Art um, Annex here in the Design District in Dallas. Prendergast, I am Director of Trust and Estates and uh, with Heritage. Um, I've opened up a few spin off Heritage um, back in July of, uh, of this past year. And he's always based in, in Houston. interesting uh, and that's partly what I'm impart to you today um, as we look at uh, some of my experiences in pursuit of treasure and uh, I'll be talking about that and bringing valuables to sale kind of what uh, what I've worked on in the past and, and what goes into bringing different objects to uh, to the auction market I'm um, we'll talk a little bit about some recent auction highlights that, that we've seen uh, then uh, get into the factors of value and kind of what are the things a house or an appraiser look at to determine these values. I'll be talking about auction estimates and then the ultimate the sale price, but there are a lot of components uh, that we'll discuss uh, that uh, allow us to arrive at these potential values of objects. And then ultimately I'm talking about the value of an appraisal and the importance of having the right type of appraisal um, for your needs. If you have any questions along the way, please feel free to just speak up, raise your hand, and I'll I'll, I'll see you, and we can, uh, you know, lead the discussion. Um, starting tonight, uh, introduce you to this girl, Baggy. Uh, she came to my attention uh, from a client in West Houston. Uh, he was gifted uh, this teddy bear uh, as a child from his grandfather, and for the last fifty so years, she had been living under his bed in a in a garbage bag basically um, he thought that maybe she had some value and, and so uh, in his later life just kind of put her away and uh, when when came to his attention again he thought uh, might as well find out what uh, what she might be worth and so uh, contacted me and, and uh, went out took some pictures consulted with uh, the teddy bear experts out there um, they happen to be based in London the ones I worked with and it turns out that uh, that her name is Baggy, and she is a uh, very rare 1908 Stife teddy bear. Uh, the only uh, known she's the only known example of her model, and um, they they only know that she actually existed from a period 1908 1909 advertising postcards that were produced by Stife. And so in in those postcards, you see her dancing with her brothers and cousins and and all these other different characters, and she's she's recognizable by her outfit. Um, so in looking at uh, bringing her to auction, um, we looked at comparables and, and what uh, other Stife bears have sold for, and the fact that she was a rare bear. And an interesting thing about her is that uh, she did have original clothing. And it's hard to tell from this photo, but if you look in the photo, her jacket is much more worn than her skirt was. Um, and initially, in the sending photos back and forth to London, the thought was that probably the skirt was a reproduction. It had been lost some some point along her life, and um, and then had been recreated to, to, to finish the ensemble. 
Uh, but when in reality, it is the original skirt, but uh, having always been owned by uh, little boys, they removed the skirt to make her into a, uh, her into a he bear. Um, and so uh, the, the skirt was actually in pristine condition. And so when she came up to auction um, in London, uh, she sold for a, a very staggering price of $20,000, which, uh, which is a lot of money for a, a little teddy bear. This is a very sweet painting. It's a British Victorian work by the artist Arthur Elsley. Um, this was painted in 1912. Uh, it's entitled The New Dress. And uh, this girl is, is showing off her new dress to her, her good pals there, her dogs. And uh, I was called by the uh, Beeville Art Association down in Beeville, Texas. Uh, Beeville is uh, basically 59 towards Corpus Christi. And when you get through Victoria, take a left, and you, you'll find Beeville. And uh, the, the Art Association in Beeville was gifted this painting from a, a local estate. And they thought possibly it had some value. And so it contacted me and uh, went out to look at it and, and researched it. And uh, in fact, it, it turned out to be this, this work by Arthur Elsley. And at the time, this was a number of years ago, um, about eight years ago, actually. And um, at the time, this painting was considered lost. And I don't know, it begs the question if Beville, Texas is in definition of lost or not. But, um, <laughs> It had been known in reproduction in, cal in calendars um, in 1915, but the actual location of the actual painting was, was unknown. And so when it turned up through this estate uh, to the Beville Art Association, um, uh, we, we brought it to sale. And uh, again, it, it sold appropriately in London, um, where in somewhat that specifically that Victorian British market is. Um, and uh, it ended up selling for 146,000 pounds, which uh, at the time was about $220,000. And needless to say, the Beeville Art Association was very, very happy with their newfound wealth and <coughs> actually made the comment to me that they wouldn't be needing to hold a bake sale that year, <laughs> which uh, I think that year are many more to come. So uh, when, I, when I talk about these prices and, and uh, values of different things, uh, it all relates to what the art and, and collectibles market is at the moment in time. And so when I talk about past sales or, or current sales or future sales, you have to take in consideration what was going on in that larger art market. And like any other market, the art market uh, fluctuates. It varies. It goes up and down, um, often in response to the, the, the wider global markets, um, but also somewhat independently. <coughs> So just like any other market, you can, you can gauge the art market and, and follow the prices, and, and especially nowadays with the internet and the ability for, for um, anybody to have access to these databases and see the trends and, and, uh, <coughs> uh, and see how different artists and different pieces by different artists have been doing. Uh, going to touch on a couple different areas of uh, some recent highlight, highlights. Uh, Talking about a little bit about the, more about the market, um, the art market in, uh, was doing very well in the 80s. Uh, took a tumble in 1991 uh, when the Japanese uh, dropped out of the market. Uh, then slowly built up again until through the tech boom, and then around 2000, 2001, took another tumble um, along with, with all the, uh, the technology money coming out of the market. And then uh, again, slowly built up and built up into really a dough in around 2006, 2007. Um, particularly in areas like contemporary art that, that we're surrounded by here, um, where people were looking to art and seeing these, these vast increases in values, uh, not only from year to year, but sometimes from one season to the next. Um, it was a very heady time, and, and we'll get more into post-war and contemporary art. But then, of course, with, with the uh, larger uh, market, we, we saw the drop from 2008 in 2008, um, basically over the summer of 2008. And uh, the art sales in, in the fall of 2008 um, obviously showed that, with, uh, with prices in different categories dropping from anywhere from 15 to 50 percent um, uh, um, across the board in, in certain categories. We've seen very steady growth since then, again, um, with uh, people's hesitation to get back into the stock market or larger um, other markets that, that failed them just fairly recently. Uh, we see. Uh, a new movement to looking at alternative investment um, opportunities, investing in tangible property as kind of a safer place to put your money, which has been good for the art market. And, and, uh, and you see that in all areas of collectibles, and as you'll see in some of my examples tonight. 
So illustration art uh, is an interesting kind of subset of American art um, that uh, Heritage specializes in. Um, the, the, the larger names in illustration art are your Norman Rockwells or your uh, Lion Deckers or people like that um, in terms of the more traditional earlier century art. Uh, another niche market within the, the illustration art uh, uh, umbrella is pinup art. And we've been seeing, uh, in particularly handling one major estate of illustration art, uh, we've seen over the course of the last few years uh, quite a, a high level of interest in these 60s uh, pinup art pieces. The, the work on the left is uh, entitled, He Thinks I'm Too Good to Be True from 1947. And uh, we, we sold this uh, in February of this year um, for $113,000, I think it was the other month. Um, these, are, these are both by an artist named Gil Elvgren, uh, <coughs> whose, whose prices have been showing to, be, to make him one of the leading pinup artists uh, out there. Uh, the work on the right is entitled Bare Facts. Uh, it's a later work by El Elvgren um, from 1962. It's estimated at fifty dollars to $70,000 and will be coming up for sale in Beverly Hills at our Be Beverly Hills location um, just uh, early next month on May 6th. The, these works, um, the work on the left was estimated at thirty to forty thousand dollars, and it sold for the one hundred and thirteen. Um, most of his works, just probably four or five years ago, his works were selling regularly when they came to auction in that twenty to thirty, maybe thirty to forty thousand dollar range. Um, but the interest has been such with his work uh, that, um, as of late, the one hundred and thirteen thousand dollar price is not unheard of. We've sold some of his works for over two hundred thousand dollars. This is uh, talking about one of the kind of classic illustration uh, works of art. This is Baby New Year of 1910 by Joseph Lyon Decker. And uh, Lyon Decker um, is known for, uh, I guess most famously, for his arrow shirt uh, men in the advertising paintings and the works he did in advertising for the, the arrow shirt uh, collar man. Very, very uh, traditional, clean cut American kind of icon of advertising. Um, this, this work uh, we offered in October of 2009 um, with an estimate of forty to $60,000 and it sold for $77,000. Uh, this is it here as it uh, graced the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. And I think uh, part of the, uh, the appeal to illustration art is uh, the fact that it is so such icons of Americana and people grew up with these images. And then when the fact that uh, uh, this art actually was used in advertising or to be on the covers of uh, certain magazines that people remember from their youth or uh, through family history. It has that added appeal. So as I mentioned a bit ago, uh, post-war post and contemporary art, um, this was a, a little image from October of 2008 of when the, uh, the contemporary art market really took a tumble. Um, in, in 06 and 07, the price was just kind of climbing. You could basically put anything on the market and expect it to sell for three, four times estimate. Um, people were being very aggressive, uh, buying uh, really artists that had no uh, pre-established auction history, but then kind of on a speculation, it was all just building on itself. And so w with the water market, it, it, the contemporary art market did take a tumble um, in the fall of 08. Uh, but, but even with that tumble, the prices that were, were being achieved in the fall of 08 have, have since rebounded are still higher than they were five years ago. So it's kind of a, in a lot of ways, it was a correction for the market, but uh, in a lot of ways came back to reality of what uh, uh, these, these works of art should, should actually be valued at. Post-war and contemporary art, this is a little side note, um, they, most uh, houses and a lot of people uh, group post-war and contemporary art together and, and the definition as I understand it anyway, post-war is basically post-World War II um, up through the 70s. So it, it's actually that, that, that legitimately that post-war period and then contemporary art is kind of 70 forward. But that's kind of a moving line as we, as we advance in time. I think uh, uh, now a lot of works that, that are done in the, in the 70s, which were considered contemporary kind of now are, are being considered more in that post-war vein. And it's, and it's really more academic in terms of how one type of art or period of art or movement within within art kind of relates to the next. This is the cover of our uh, 
uh, Heritage's first modern contemporary art sale um, just this past October. Um, Heritage has uh, been expanding our sale categories in fine decorative arts uh, to include modern and contemporary arts. Um, and as you can see around us, we are just uh, preparing for the, uh, the next upcoming sale on June 9th um, here in these sale rooms. This sale did very well. It was a very selective sale. Um, as our entry into the market, uh, we, were, we were sure to, uh, uh, under the guidance of Frank Hettig, who heads up our, sale, our modern contemporary sales, uh, to, to be sure that we included a select you know, works that were uh, very good examples um, and then not too uh, unreasonably priced. And, and that was the key to it. This, this cover lot is a uh, detail of a very large work by Paul Jenkins uh, from 1969. And uh, it was estimated 14 to $18,000, so very accessible price range um, for the work. And it ended up selling for $33,000. So not, not unrealistic, but uh, uh, a good solid price for a work by Jenkins. Uh, we have two, two, I think there's two works upcoming by Jenkins, good example from the 60s. Um, uh, in the upcoming sale as well. We'll see how those do as well. Uh, contemporary art can be challenging. And this is a work where you could argue whether it's post-war or contemporary. Um, this is actually would be considered post-war. This is a work by Joan Mitchell, and this was in, in that October uh, modern contemporary auction. This is a small work by Mitchell, um, and it's late for her. It's a 1982 painting, um, just 18 by 24 inches. So a foot and a half by two feet. And uh, her work uh, is, is very sought after. Large works from the 60s and into the 70s sell extremely well, sell for millions and millions of dollars. Um, large works can sell for between three and seven million dollars from, from the 60s and 70s. And very similar to this, uh, very free form um, abstract artist. Uh, this, this painting uh, sold was a top lot in our first auction and sold for $262,000. The actually, the, the, the highest estimated lot in the upcoming sale is this work by uh, Bruce Nauman um, from the 1980s, and that's estimated at $250,000 to $350,000, which, which again is, is a good conservative, realistic estimate for his work. And so we'll, we'll see you know, exactly how the market is and see how that, how that one sells. American and Texas art has been a very strong uh, market over the last uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, the American art market in particular has, has grown in leaps and bounds uh, since the 1980s. Uh, if you were buying American art in the, in the 70s or even into uh, the 80s, uh, you did very well. Texas art, being here in Texas, again, Heritage is uh, uh, making one of our focuses to, to have Texas art specific auctions and to become a leader in the Texas art market. This is a work. Um, by an artist that, that you all might recognize. Uh, by Ju this is Julian Onderdonk, and he's kind of the, the father of Texas blue, bon blue bonnet paintings. Uh, this was a, a large painting, 40 by 50 inches, that uh, came to me uh, through a collector in, in Houston. It was, it was not a part of an estate, um, but it was uh, kind of a, uh, an estate planning decision to sell the painting. They wanted to oversee the sale of it. Um, they really didn't have a sense as to value. They know. Um, they had, had owned it for a long time. They, uh, they thought it, it potentially could have some significant value. Uh, it was estimated at fifty dollars to $70,000, and this was back in 2002, I believe. Yes, 2002. Um, went to sale in Los Angeles um, and ended up selling for $207,000, which at the time <coughs> was the record for an underdog painting and for a, a Texas work of art, um, well, from this period. And uh, that the actually the record now for an underdog blue bonnet painting stands at three hundred thousand um, dollars, which was uh, just set October of this past year. Um, this work, which you may have noticed on the on the way in, we we have a, a preview exhibition of the upcoming uh, pieces in the in the uh, Texas Art and Western Art of the American West um, auction that'll be uh, next month. This little uh, gem of an underdog is a uh, great example of his small uh, misty morning scenes. And uh, you can, you'll see out there, it's, it's a tiny little painting. I mean, it's not tiny, but it's a, uh, I think it's just nine by 12 inches. Uh, but if it's a great example of, of impressionism uh, in Texas with, with everything you want in a blue bonnet painting. Um, you've got this great hill country kind of scene, the, uh, 
the path going through the landscape, all the blue bonnets, this, this really uh, kind of ethereal, misty morning uh, impressionistic look at, at Texas uh, in 1917 uh, is when this was painted. Uh, we've actually since had it cleaned, and so you can go see it now. This was prior to the cleaning. Um, a lot of the varnish and everything on it had been faded. And, um, in some way, gave it a little bit of that, that more of that ephemeral, misty kind of morning feel. But you can see it on, on your way out. Uh, you know, keep an eye out for it and uh, see if you like it better cleaned or not. This painting is estimated actually at eighty to one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and so we'll, we'll we'll see how it does. In terms of American art, um, this is a watercolor, um, not the most recognizable by this artist. is actually an, a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. And uh, this painting was uh, uh, also from 1917, the same, same year as that Onderdonk. Uh, this was when, uh, when O'Keeffe was uh, in West Texas. And so this is kind of her modernistic impression abstracted of kind of the West, Tex West Texas sky with kind of a, a rolling storm coming in. And uh, this is uh, really a piece that comes from an important part of her career when she was really developing um, her modernistic um, uh, aesthetic and was working in, in these abstract forms and, and really abstracting everything that was around her um, in this very, very kind of progressive modern, uh, modern style. So that again, like I said, this is a watercolor. It's uh, 31 by 22 inches and this is came to sale through the Tobin um, Foundation in San Antonio. And it had been owned by the uh, Tobin Foundation um, and was sold uh, to benefit the McNay Museum, also in San Antonio. And so it, it came to auction in New York, um, estimated at four to $600,000. Um, it was a great example by O'Keeffe from that period. Not a lot of watercolors. Most have found their way to museums um, from that period. So the, Comparables weren't there for a direct comparable, and so uh, at the time we felt that four to six hundred thousand dollars was a very uh, reasonable and realistic estimate for the for the piece. Um, after some intense bidding by a lot of uh, institutions and museums, it ended up selling for over three million dollars. So talking about all these these prices and everything and these auction estimates, um, I want to hit on on these these five uh, components of value, and these are things that we look at as an auction house when we uh, try to determine what that, that proper auction estimate will be um, when you bring something to the market. Uh, we have provenance, rarity, quality, condition, and fashion. So provenance is um, something that usually in an auction ca uh, catalog you'll see provenance listed after the description of the, of the work of art or collectible or whatever it is. And provenance is the history of ownership of an object. Um, but it's a little more than the history of ownership. Um, also in the catalog, you'll see um, exhibition history or where it's been reproduced. That's all part of the, the component. So rather than just um, ownership, it's basically the story of the life that an object has led. And uh, provenance can affect value. Um, this is an example. You've got a hat. It's a early 1960s fedora. Um, it it's comes from a... a, a pretty upscale um, New York hat maker from the period. Um, if you were to sell it today, it's a, it's a hat's worth $100, something like that, for a nice period, 1960s fedora. Uh, but when, with a proper provenance, you place it in a moment in time, and uh, that's Jack Ruby there on the right um, wearing it, um, and with his initials in the hat, um, you could trace it back by ownership directly to, to Ruby, um, and uh, this came to uh, sale through Heritage uh, just uh, just last year, and it ended up selling rather than a hundred dollar hat, it sold for fifty three thousand dollars. And so, as an example of, of when provenance can really drive the, the value and the price for an object. And of course, anytime you have celebrity major historical provenance, that can help. But more subtle provenance, well. Um, when uh, certain very well-known collectors have owned an object or a work of art, that can add uh, mystique and desirability in the market. Um, rarity can drive value, but uh, rar rarity alone isn't always enough. Um, we get a lot of calls of, of, from people saying, I've got the only one of something in the world, and it's got to be worth, you know, it's priceless. 
and the fact that it is priceless because there's, there's really no value to it because you have the only one in the world and there's no market for it. Um, so, so rarity is a good thing, but rarity to a, to a point, to an extreme, you can basically rare yourself out of that having any type of a market. Um, as an example of that, this is a, a 1804 um, silver dollar. This, this coin is known as the king and it's the ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, coin rarity. And when, when it, in the rare cases that it does come to market, when an example of this coin comes to market, it's always a big, big event. Uh, this, this example is uh, one of 15 known. So that's a, that's a good component where you have 15 known examples of this coin. Um, it's rare, but it's not unheard of. Um, and then of those 15, there are, um, I think the, the majority of them, I think there's only, there's only three left in private hands. So the rest have already found their way to museums. And so again, increasing the, the rarity of the coin. Um, and this was actually, uh, this one was the last, all the others, I'm sorry, were, were uh, in, are in museums. And this was the last one uh, to be available on the market. And uh, this one was actually named the Adams Carter example of this, of this silver dollar. Um, was, was early on owned by uh, Phineas Adams in 1880 and then uh, came through the hands of uh, our fellow Texan Eamon Carter and then his son Eamon Carter Jr. And so um, they, the Carters purchased it in 1950 and owned it uh, until Junior's death in 1982. Um, this came on the market, uh, it come on the market a couple times, but uh, Heritage had the opportunity of selling this coin in April of last year uh, for $2.3 million. You know, I'm not sure, but I, I think I would have heard if it had gone to a museum. And, um, and I apologize for my, my, my coin knowledge and this is a big part of Heritage's business and I'm learning what I can about coins, but I'm still very new to the coin game. It's very interesting though. Uh, quality, well, obviously intrinsic quality can drive the value of an object. Uh, a good quality painting, a good, good quality piece of silver, it's gonna have that inherent value because of, of the workmanship and, and the quality. In, um, in decorative arts in particular, quality, obviously, because you're, you're gonna see a lot of examples of, of certain types of objects, <clears throat> the, the quality, again, of the workmanship uh, can really establish uh, significant values. This is a, the top of a table, and it's a, a micro mosaic, which is a, a form of mosaics. Uh, they're tiny little pieces of, of marble and different types of stone. And these were made primarily in, in, in Italy um, from obviously uh, mosaics from uh, early Greek and Roman times through to today. Um, the uh, micro mosaics that are part of furniture or paperweights or little objects of virtue <coughs> that we see a lot of um, usually are made in the 19th century and, and were uh, classic uh, souvenirs that people would pick up on their grand tour when Americans or, or Englishmen would, would tour the, uh, the, classics, the classic areas of, of Europe um, they would pick up souvenirs. And so these souvenirs of the Grand Tour, there's a micro mosaic like this, um, would, uh, would find their way back to America or to England. Uh, this example is a 19th century, late 19th century, early uh, 20th century. Um, we're not sure if it came from one of the Vatican workshops or not, probably did not, but, but it's most likely Italian. Um, we, uh, it's, it's a large example of a micro mosaic, as I mentioned, they're, most of them are very small little um, uh, paperweights or little vignettes, uh, but this is a 40 inch diameter uh, table, which is, uh, these are quite spectacular when you see them in person. I have the details, you can see actually the little mosaic pieces, uh, but they almost look photographic when you see them in person because it's such, such uh, uh, high craftsmanship in putting these together. Uh, this example was estimated at uh, seven to $9,000 um, in our uh, November 9th uh, to last year's uh, decorative arts sale and ended up selling for $47,000. Uh, so, so the market really saw the, the uh, intrinsic quality of the piece and was willing to pay a premium for that. Condition is, is a key, key part of, uh, of determining value and especially mentioning coins, it, it can be a, a huge component um, of coins. Um, When you, uh, especially in art, um, this is a uh, painting 
that a, uh, this is kind of a classic story that I think a lot of uh, people that talk in the art business use this, these slides, and so I apologize for the, for the, the quality of the slide. Uh, this painting was uh, owned by a woman in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan in the 1980s, and uh, she tried to sell it at a tag sale. And she put a $5 price tag on it, and no one would buy it because of the condition. You can't hang it in your house the way it is. It's just, you know, it's, it's just in deplorable condition. Um, fortunately, she had a friend who was a local appraiser who said, you know what, um, maybe you should have that painting checked out to see if it's you know, by anybody famous. And so she pursued it with some museums and auction houses, and it was researched, and it was determined that it was a, a painting of Madonna and Child with St. John by the Italian uh, Renaissance, Renaissance artist uh, uh, Guido Reni. And uh, it was actually brought to auction in this condition. Um, the, the concept is also, and auction houses can assist the sellers with this, whether something should be cleaned or repaired prior to sale or, or or not, um, whether that restoration is going to really affect the value or not. Um, a lot of times buyers want to oversee the restoration or the cleaning of a work of art themselves so they know it's done kind of to their specifications. Uh, so this painting came to auction. It was estimated at three to four hundred thousand dollars in its in in this state. Um, and this was in nineteen eighty four. And so uh, it ended up selling even in this condition for six hundred and sixty thousand dollars again in nineteen eighty four. And then subsequent to that, that the, uh, the new owner had it cleaned and restored, and it, it presented much better. And what, uh, you know, what it's worth today, I, I haven't heard that it came back, has come back on the market. But then he also throws in the question, the condition now is much better, it presents much better, but how much of this painting now is actually by the hand of the master, and how much is done by the restorer? So um, the, you could debate the, uh, the pros and cons, obviously, of, of and the value of it in, in a much nicer condition. Um, as I mentioned, coins, uh, the value of coins is significantly driven condition. Uh, the rarity of coins is, is almost fully based on that condition. Uh, this is a 1990 penny. You probably, you know, people have these in their pockets right now. Um, this has been graded by one of the professional grading services, and uh, this, uh, in the middle of the there, it says 1991 cent. PCGS is the grading service, and it's PR for proof. And then 69, the the highest grade of condition that a coin can have is 70. And <clears throat> for penny collectors, um, this is this is an excellent excellent grade. There are actually no known uh, proof 70s um, to exist, and there are let's see, I think um, there was only 21 examples of of having a proof state 69 to have been graded. And so when this, this came up to sale in February of last year, um, this one penny from 1990, uh, no other kind of special thing going on with it other than its condition, um, sold for $18,400. Which is, you know, to me, again, not coming from a coin background, is quite incredible. <laughs> um, but that's not even the highest price for, for pennies. I mean, more, I, I guess more understandably to me, um, pennies from modern contemporary times can sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, but those are usually more kind of misstriked or oddities or rarities. Um, but uh, but a good example of how, how condition in, in certain markets can uh, really uh, drive a price. So the fashion and trends um, also, it's kind of about the wider market, but it, the underlying fashion and trends, kind of what's in vogue at that time, um, what are people willing to pay for? It, it's a, it can drive a market, but it's kind of a, a cautionary um, reason to be buying something because if you're catching a trend on the upswing, great. If you're planning on selling something fairly, you know, during that upswing, um, but if you get in on a, a, a trendy fashion uh, too late, you could, you know, feel the feel the ill effects of that. So with contemporary art really taking off um, through the early 2000s. Um, up through 2007, along those lines, people really take no took notice of those 50s, 60s designer uh, furniture and decorative arts, uh, 20th century design material. And this uh, desk is by um, the designer Maurice Kalka, C-A-L-K-A, French designer. It's called the Boomerang Desk uh, from 1969. 
and it's a fiberglass desk, very much in that 2001 Space Odyssey um, design mode. And uh, this was actually collecting dust in a uh, gentleman's warehouse in Houston. And he knew what he had. He, it was a you know interesting 60s, you know kind of space age looking funky desk. And uh, he knew it was, it was a kind of an important design thing. I don't know what he had paid for it, but uh, uh, he had no use for it. And, and like I said, it was just sitting in a warehouse. Uh, so when it, when it came to auction, we had estimated at thirty to fifty thousand dollars, which was basically the going price auction results had shown for such a desk by Kolka. And other examples had come to, to sale, um, all selling usually within that thirty to fifty thousand dollar range. Um, this was in uh, December of 2007, so you're really at the, the height of the contemporary market. A lot of interest in mid-century um, uh, design material, and um, so when this came up to auction, and, and I have to also note that this was kind of a unique example with the attached chair. The other examples had, didn't have the attached chair. Um, this desk was actually for 1969. was very high tech. It was all internally wired for. Um, that little black square on the right is a TV monitor, and it was kind of the desk of the future. And you had, you know, no one knowing that, you know, how much we would rely on computers and everything, but it was still that, that space age, kind of like I'm going to be talking to a monitor and, and need all these wiring in my desk. Probably could be very functional nowadays. Um, but when it came to auction in December 2007, um, it uh, estimated thirty dollars to $50,000. It ended up selling for $480,000 which is an incredible price for it. And um, obviously, this was December 2007. It was in 2008. We saw the market come down. Since this sale, um, two other examples have come on the market. Again, not with the attached chair, but still nice examples. And they've, they've sold for that thirty dollars to $50,000 range. I think one sold for like $35,000. The other one did $40,000. So maybe this was just a moment in time. But again, it's a good example of, of when you catch that trend at the right time, whether you're buying or selling, um, it can be beneficial or, or not. I mean, it remains to be seen whether the buyer of this really ridiculously overpaid for it or not um, until it comes to market again or, you know, uh, uh, if the market does rise to it. Or maybe this is a particularly nice or special example that, that would still um, find that price again. In terms of classical tastes and items, um, Classic pieces of silver, like this uh, William IV silver gilt covered presentation cup. Um, it's English, 1831, 1832, uh, by the uh, silversmith uh, Joseph and John Engel. And th this is an aesthetic that, that's going to carry over throughout time. I mean, this is something that uh, uh, is not the most trendy thing, but it's kind of uh, an area of collecting that has consistent, steady growth. Um, this, this uh, presentation cup uh, was sold through Heritage, estimated twenty thirty thousand dollars in November of this last year, and uh, ended up selling for thirty eight thousand dollars. So good solid price. You're not going to see it take off crazy. It's not going to sell for four hundred thousand um, dollars. But uh, fortunately, with this market, uh, a big proponent of this market is the international base uh, for these, these uh, traditional aspects of, of furniture and decorative arts. You have your Middle Eastern buyers and your Russians um, getting involved in the market and um, maintaining the prices and then driving those prices in many respects. Um, fortunately now, with um, the Internet, um, Heritage, most auction houses are tied into the Internet. Uh, Heritage does allow you to bid live during our auctions in this room um, where there's a camera and you can actually bid through the Internet uh, to uh, during the live auction. And so we have bidders from Russia and the Middle East um, to, to take advantage of uh, uh, and get in on the bidding for these for these types of items. So ultimately, when you have a combination of all these factors, that's when you have your perfect storm of uh, of conditions to uh, to see some really really incredible uh, prices achieved uh, at auction. And going back to our teddy bears, uh, this is another Stife bear. Uh, she's referred to as Teddy Girl. And she exemplifies um, all the best states of the conditions of, of value and uh, subsequently uh, resulted in, in setting the world record for a teddy bear. Uh, she, uh, she's a very rare early bear. She's the only known um, one to exist of her model. 
she's in great condition for her age, almost pristine. Um, this, this, she was made in 1905, and there's no losses that, that anybody can see on, on this bear. Uh, she had a single owner, which for teddy bear collectors, that's the greatest provenance you can have. That uh, it was, uh, she's presented to the market from the original owner, or through the family of that original owner, and. Um, this bear is considered the highest quality that, that Stipe produced at the time. Uh, she was the largest model and, and the, the top of the line uh, teddy bear for 1905. Uh, and also, uh, when, when she came to market in uh, 1994, um, it was the height of the teddy bear market, if there is such a thing. Um, but <laughs> teddy bears were in vogue, or, or however you want to explain it, but uh, uh, people were paying high prices for teddy bears in, in the mid 90s. And uh, she ended up setting uh, the, the record that still stands today for a, a teddy bear, um, selling for $160,000, which, when you compare it to other works of art, is, is not such a high number. But, but again, you got to remember that you're talking about a teddy bear here. Um, comic books, an interesting thing. Again, something I, I never worked with in the past until joining Heritage. Um, comic books sell amazingly well. Um, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more in vogue. Um, I guess it's been in vogue in very kind of specific collector groups to collect comic books. Everybody knows about uh, children collecting comic books, but those children are now adults and uh, getting points in their lives where they, um, they have the money to really invest on, on the, the, the best examples of these comic books. This is uh, Detective Comics of 1939. Um, this is the first appearance of Batman in a comic book. And um, Superman is considered the ultimate comic book hero. And uh, previous to this uh, comic book coming to, uh, to market um, just uh, two months ago, uh, Superman, a Superman comic, Superman number one, uh, set the record uh, previous to this for the highest price paid for a comic book, which was around 300 something thousand dollars. Uh, so when this, this, this example, uh, again, great condition, the best known condition is rated at 8.0 on a 10-point scale for comic books. Uh, had great provenance. Um, being the first Batman is very desirable. Uh, comic books, uh, the prices for comic books have been rising. People are looking to invest um, in tangible assets at this time. So at this coming to auction uh, in February of uh, this year, uh, estimate expected to sell for in the uh, three to four hundred thousand dollar range, which still would have set it as the highest price paid for. A uh, comic book uh, ended up uh, selling after a bidding war for a uh, million seventy-five thousand dollars, which is in now in the Guinness Book of World Records for the highest highest price paid for a comic book, as it should have been, just shattering the price of comic books. I mean, um, you know, by by six hundred thousand dollars basically. And in this same auction, um, other comic books sold in that three to four hundred thousand dollar range. Um, which really is just interesting to see, and it really takes comic books into a whole new level. I mean, once you kind of break that million dollar mark in any collecting group, uh, people really start taking notice um, as that collection, as that collecting group to be a, a serious uh, component of anybody's portfolio asset. Um, so talking about all these values, um, it's, uh, it's important, uh, and I want to just uh, kind of get to a little nuts and bolts, talk about uh, appraisals and auction estimates. And I talk about these auction estimates and then the subsequent sale prices. Um, but then there's another valuation, which is the appraisal. Um, and, and appraisals are used for a lot of different reasons, and I'll talk about those in a minute. And we're approached all the time by um, clients asking us for an appraisal. And uh, the term appraisal is thrown around, and, and it, when you watch the Antique Roadshow, it's, you know, people, this is verbal appraisals. Those aren't technically appraisals. Um, they're, they're providing a, a kind of an opinion of value. Um, their valuation is not going to hold up to the IRS or you know any other purposes. Um, and you have to be very careful when you listen to the Antique Roadshow and watch it. Um, a lot of times they'll say, "Well, if this was in my if this was in my gallery, I would expect to see it sell for forty thousand dollars." Or um, they'll, they'll say, uh, "You know, if I saw this at auction, or I would see this presented at auction." And those are different values. Um, you're talking about retail in a gallery setting versus an auction uh, estimate, which is more of a wholesale value or a fair market value. And um, the difference in those values can be somewhat significant. So say we're talking about a teddy bear, 
um, at auction it's expected to sell between twenty and thirty thousand dollars and that's what the market has shown history has shown um, where the market is because of all the factors that we just discussed um, the auction house um, believes that presenting it in the market with a pre-sale printed in the catalog auction estimate of twenty or thirty thousand dollars will um, serve the purpose of letting the seller really realistically know what he can expect to, to get for it and then also for the buyers uh, to uh, show them what uh, they can expect to pay for it. Of course, at auction, things can sell for much more, as, we, as we've seen. Um, the, 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 the ultimately, the sale price will be the true market value. On that given day, in that setting, that's what the piece is worth, whatever it achieves at auction. For appraisals, you don't have the, the, um, the benefit of knowing actually what is actually going to sell for in that market. So you have to look at comparables and like sales and, and the history. Um, so the fair market value for, for something like this, the estimated twenty to thirty thousand um, dollars, and then the retail replacement cost. So the fair market value um, for this, realistically, would probably be somewhere around twenty five thousand dollars. It's that mean of that auction estimate. And so for uh, appraisal purposes, if you were doing a, a tax appraisal um, and using that fair market value, that twenty five thousand dollars is a justifiable valuation. Now, if for insurance purposes you may want to use a retail replacement cost. And that retail replacement, if you had a total loss of that object, you'd probably have to replace it in a timely manner. And that timely manner may be um, in the retail market. Uh, of course, that's between you and your insurance company to, to, to determine whether you want to uh, you know, use a fair market value or a retail replacement cost, because obviously your uh, premiums are going to be based on the, the value of, of the collection. And so you know, in a retail setting, that same item um, estimated and could sell for $20,000 at auction, um, realistically has a fair market value of $25,000. At retail, you could justify it being a $40,000 piece. Um, there are certain areas like jewelry where the, uh, the difference between a uh, retail replacement value can be quite different than the auction estimate or the fair market value. Um, regularly, we see people approach us with their insurance appraisal for their jewelry and um, expecting to get these prices for it um, when uh, the retail pricing for jewelry in particular can be three, four times higher than what the actual fair market value is. And, and of course, there are, there are um, examples when that's not true and things are worth a lot more. Um, but again, that depends on the market, that whether the, the diamond market is particularly strong or like now when the gold market is, is extremely strong, um, which helps out um, in, in, in certain areas. So types of appraisals, um, which we, we sort of just discussed, there's insurance appraisals, which don't have any tax implications. That's, a, that's a, between you and the insurance company. And so when you hire an appraiser uh, for an insurance uh, appraisal, it's actually they, when they produce that appraisal, it has a um, whole s different set of guidelines that they follow. Um, and it, it's usually can be either the fair market value or the retail replacement cost uh, valuation. And that's something to discuss with the appraiser um, of what you want um, uh, to use. For tax purposes, uh, the IRS dictates all types of uh, specific guidelines and regulations. Um, actually, just spent uh, Sunday and Monday of this week taking the USPATH class, which is uh, the uh, Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, which uh, is uh, the, basically the guidelines um, of how the IRS wants appraisals to be uh, conducted. And they become much more stringent on, on what the actual appraisal uh, product looks like. And, and for tax purposes, every type of tax appraisal has its, its specific guidelines and regulations that the appraiser must follow, um, whether it's for a state tax, um, which is uh, most of the time a fair market value appraisal. Um, but depending on the state, there's the, the estate situation and the property that's in the estate, um, there's different types of subset valuations, uh, market cash valuation, or if there's a lot of the same type of item, like particularly in an artist's estate, um, there can be a, a, a mass appraisal or a blockage discount, a discount to the overall value of everything because there's just so much. And since you're valuing it um, for estate purposes as of that date of death, um, you have to look at it as if, if everything in that state entered the market at that one time. And so that are all components that the appraiser must look at uh, when they're coming up with those values. 
gift tax, um, when you're gifting something um, to another individual, um, that, that's again, that's usually a fair market value, uh, but for certain types of property and certain situations, um, that can be, you can look at the retail market for those valuations. And then uh, charitable donations, um, probably the, the trickiest of the appraisals because the uh, IRS is, is so, um, uh, they scrutinize charitable donations so much. I want to make sure that uh, the donation is legitimate and uh, does meet all the requirements so that you do get that tax benefit. And uh, charitable donations, uh, the regulations for charitable donations have, as, as I said, become more strict um, because of abuses of the past. And uh, there's a lot of different components that, that your appraiser will be very aware of. Should you uh, be gifting something to uh, an institution, to a nonprofit or organization, um, ask the questions and your appraiser should work with you um, on, that does meet all the requirements so you do get the tax benefit. Um, the worst thing you could do is you, know, you donate something and then end of the day, it doesn't, uh, either the appraisal itself or the item um, in terms of its relation to the the, don the donor, um, I'm sorry, the donee um, institution, if it's not a similar related use, then maybe wouldn't be accepted by the IRS and you wouldn't get that full um, benefit. And then ultimately, uh, probably the easiest uh, appraisals to do um, is for uh, estate and financial planning. And I, and I say easiest in terms of it doesn't have all the guidelines. This is more informative for you as, as the collector or as you're planning for your finances and your um, uh, estate planning, just to really to get a sense as to what the value, the current value of your collectibles, your tangible items are. And um, and again, usually for these purposes, you want to use a fair market value so that you can have that realistic understanding of um, if you were to, to sell the items, where they would be in the market uh, today. And so that, that's basically it. I'll take questions. Um, this is a, a room shot of the room that you guys are in. Um, this was during an illustration art auction. Um, uh, I guess just this past fall. Uh, so I do uh, invite you all back to, uh, to come here during an auction to check it out and, and uh, see how it all goes. It's, it's quite interesting and it can be a lot of fun to watch, uh, to watch some of these treasures come to market. So thank you very much. And any questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. there, is, um, there are uh, professional conservators and restorers that, that you can hire to, to give you um, advice as to the best way to do that. Auction houses are a great, great source for that. I mean, feel free to um, call up a specialist within an auction house or a dealer um, in that particular area. I mean, something like books, um, you can call the, the books and manuscripts department uh, here at Heritage or talk to a book dealer and they can probably provide the advice. Um, things like books, nowadays you want to use acid-free store boxes and um, in any works on paper and art. Likewise, anytime you're dealing with paper, you want to um, make sure everything's acid-free and then also has UV protection. Um, where glass nowadays you can get our UV protected. Um, you know, obviously don't leave books or, or any works on paper out in the sun. And uh, it, it's a very subtle thing, and, and over time, though, you'll notice the fading. Um, and so you do, particularly if it works, anything on paper, you have to be very careful. Um, and also, like the oils from your hands, you have to be very careful with that because they can leave um, residue and stain you may not see for 20 years, but then over time, um, little fingerprints and everything will show up. And so using gloves to handle anything that, uh, that you want to keep in the best condition is, is really helpful. Yes, sir. Um, it, it depends on self, uh, and, and again, I would consult with also oh, um, it's like like to uh, to be you know polishing it up. Um, I, I know a lot of, a lot of times we you see coins they look great, uh, but the fact that they've been polished just 
nullifies the value. And then you know you're back just to look thick, polished to look. And it's the classic like American furniture. Everybody hears the stories about you know someone someone you know beyond pledging like waxed their you know or took the patina off or cleaned up a, a piece of early American furniture. But the inherent value was in that that original patina of the of the piece of furniture. Yeah. Sure, I mean, we can talk after, I mean, it's fine. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah, most definitely. Yes. That, that's actually, it, yeah, that's, that's actually a very big issue that's, that, that's been going on in the art world um, as of late. I mean, it's only been um, the last, within the last 10 years that, um, that uh, a lot of the, the European uh, nations have, the, the EU in particular, has recognized people's claims for uh, World War II um, restitution, is what they call it. Um, and so, Basically, it also happens um, when um, things come to kind of visible market. So when, when an object will come to auction, to public auction, that's when it's seen, and that's when maybe a, a family member, a great-grandchild um, will remember you know, having this piece in their family prior to World War II, and then it disappears. Um, you know, there are all types of stories of pieces that, that have hung at museums for quite a long time, and then the great-grandkid Going through family archives, found a picture of the painting hanging in great grandma's, you know, living room, in you know, in Germany, and, and they were a Jewish family, and it was a forced sale, and um, and it was just kind of lost to the world, or that that forced sale wasn't known about yet, you know, um, people can fake provenances, and so kind of fill in the gaps, and so you always have to be very um, uh, aware of any time there's a lapse in provenance or a questionable provenance through the war years, um, because the, the Nazis did. They, they, they did confiscate huge art collections and then, um, and then basically distributed or kind of, uh, you know, through, through themselves or to their particular museums. And um, it's, it's going to be it's still a long process to, to have these pieces restituted to the proper families. And uh, I think it's, it's going to go on for a while, and things are going to continue to come up. And, and it's also a function of that generation is passing away. And so whether that's um, your warrior generation is passing away, so, so is that bringing certain things to market or, or the families are paying more practical attention. Um, and it's also just because it's more publicized now and so people are just more aware of it. Um, you're going to continually hear situations like that. But fortunately, the governments um, and the museums in particular are very quick to uh, to, to make those restitutions and, and to provide these, these pieces back to families. And it's not always the easiest thing because, like you said, it, it's passed through multiple people's hands. And so, you know, kind of who's left holding the bag? Um, mm What well, you're saying is not the authenticity, but the fact that it, it wasn't, you know, that didn't have a clear, clear title basically at that point. There's actually um, a group um, called the Art Lost Registry, and they're a nonprofit, and uh, uh, they maintain a database of all sh stolen works of art. And it is the museum's responsibility before they accept a donation or a gift or anything like that. It is a auction house's responsibility to check. And it's also appraiser's responsibility when they're working on an appraisal to check that um, with the art, re art loss registry that the piece isn't recorded there. But that does, again, it doesn't mean just because it's not recorded doesn't mean it is in fact. So it's, it's a process of, of getting everything well documented and, and checked. But there's always going to be, um, not always going to be, but there, you know, we're going to see a lot of those situations come up um, in, the, in, in the 
full coming years. Yes, sir. Um, appraisal fees depend on the appraiser. Um, at Heritage, we charge uh, three hundred fifty dollars an hour for our, for our appraiser's time, and that's the time that they're physically working on site on the appraisal. And uh, uh, usually, depending on what what type of appraisal it is, we'll look at the whole uh, job as a whole and uh, see how long it's going to take, and we'll, we'll provide you with an estimate of what it's going to cost to to complete the uh, the product. And then you know we, we, we can talk about that and make sure we're all comfortable with, with that number. Um, generally, appraisers not generally they, appraisers have to charge um, either by the hour or, or they can charge also kind of by the object. Um, they obviously can't charge based on the value of the object. That that would just that's conflict of interest, you know. So um, uh, there is regulations on how an appraiser does charge his fees. Um, in terms of uh, commissions at, uh, at for auction houses. Um, they, they range from house to house, but for the most part, your seller, as a seller, you're going to be paying anywhere from 20% um, of the sale price down to you know, a few percent. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a sliding sc scale inversely proportional to the value. So the higher value the object sells for, the lower uh, seller's fee you're going to pay. Um, buyers, is their auction houses also charge a buyer's premium because uh, we're purely a middleman. Um, the buyer's premium is the same for everybody. You, you, there's never any discount or changes to that, um, so that all bidders are on the same playing field. And that, uh, again, th th there is a, when you get to very, very high dollar things, it, it can go down, but uh, um, for the most part, most houses are at 20%. Uh, I mean, heritage is 19.5%. Um, some houses, like Christie's, I know just having worked there, um, when an item that sells for under, I think it was under fifty thousand dollars, or maybe it was twenty thousand dollars. You pay twenty-five percent buyer's premium, and from twenty thousand dollars to whatever half a million, it was uh, then down to twenty percent, and then over. It's kind of a sliding scale as as the value went up, but for the most part, I can talk specifically about heritage. Nineteen and a half percent, um, the, the the buyer pays, um, so. and then also. Uh, Well, they'll, they'll pay a, they pay a seller's fee, so kind of a, a seller's commission, and that's um, anywhere from, realistically, it's going to be somewhere around 15% or less um, of that. And, and that's, an, that's a negotiable point. And depending about the extent of the collection, how desirable it is to bring the, the house to bring it to market. Um, and again, I'm talking about heritage. You're going to be talking, and it depends on the category, too. Um, coin auctions, I think they, they start at 10%. Um, and then go down from there. So it, it really depends on what, what the venue is that you'll be selling it at. But for the most part, um, it's going to be where some probably somewhere in the 15 to 10 percent. But I know like some some local auction houses um, in different cities, because they deal in, in all very low value, like under a thousand, they charge 30, 40 percent, because it, it costs the same amount of money for a house to deal with a hundred dollar item as it does a hundred thousand dollar item. For the most part, you know. So. Yes, sir. Um, the gift tax. So now a gift tax, not not a charitable don donation. You're talking about a gift tax when you're gifting something to an individual. So you're gifting something to your kids, something like that. Um, the uh, the person doing the gift pays the tax. Um, now you're not talking about when it's part of an estate situation. Um, Right now, in 2010, the, the estate tax was repealed. And this is probably getting off subject, but you know, so right now there's no estate tax, um, which presumably is, is a you know is a great thing for estates because you don't have to you don't have to pay any estate tax. Um, but then anybody that receives anything through an estate, an heir that, that receives um, uh, some uh, some value or some property, they get capital gains on it at that point in time. But but. Uh, as I understand it, for gift tax, if you are gifting it to somebody, it's over that $13,000 mark, because you're allowed to gift um, up to $13,000 uh, to each individual uh, per individual per year. 
um, once you once you're over that amount, then and the, the gift I'm not sure what exactly what the gift tax rate is, but you do pay a, a gift tax. You would pay that um, prior to the gift. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, most definitely. And that's part of what you're paying the auction house for when you pay in. Um, <clears throat> you're paying that fee for the marketing, and that's that's our job. Um, besides producing the full color catalogs, uh, we we do vast. In we do travel paintings. I know. Uh, the uh, Cassetta, the Center for the Advancement of Early, the Advancement Early and Study of er, Study and Advancement of Early Texas Art, Cassetta, um, their their annual convention conference is in Houston next week, and so like we're bringing a selection of our Texas works of art to visit this at this conference as a as a marketing uh, tool because all all major collectors of Texas art are going to be there in Houston um, this weekend, so. It's our job to to uh, to market those, and so and that's and that's though. I mean, Heritage has the uh, unique ability to uh, do a lot of cross marketing, especially with uh, being coin uh, auction house. Uh, we have all these coin buyers who also buy art, collectibles, uh, decorative arts. Do a lot of cross marketing ourselves, and we find incredible amount of buyers who you wouldn't normally identify. Would be interested in in a certain object, but but by doing that cross marketing, uh, we bring it to a, the attention of the most people possible. And the internet's an amazing thing nowadays. I mean, with with the online bidding, and then all the catalogs all the online, I mean, we get we get bidders from all over the world, and uh, you know it's just amazing how people. If you, if you have good things and you present it to the market, people will find it. It's, it's amazing how they do it nowadays. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. for an auction house, but it's through an auction. <laughs> I know. I, if, okay, if it was my painting, um, I actually have a painting that's coming to sale in the June um, uh, Modern Contemporary Art Auction, and painting that I've owned for a while, and I, time to sell for whatever reason. And, um, and so I thought about that. I've said, okay, well, I could put this at auction. Um, I know I'm going to have to bite the bullet with the estimate. Because the, es the auction estimate may not exactly be, because I, I know it has to be enticing to bidders. Um, but if, if I'm comfortable with, enough with that, and also at auction you can set a reserve price for, for for most fairly valuable things, lower valuable things we don't we don't usually like to carry a reserve price because your goal is to sell it, and if it's low enough value, we don't want to have it not sell and then have to reoffer it. So um, there's a certain price point where usually under a couple thousand dollars where we will sell most of our items are no reserve. So they sell for whatever they sell for, um, but in my example, the estimate was okay to me. I set a reserve price that I was comfortable with. Worst case scenario, if it hits that reserve price, I'm not going to be the happiest camper in the world. But you know, I I, I understand. I, you need to have that, um, and uh, and I looked at also selling through dealers because kind of bird in hand. Okay, I can I can set an asking price. One component is kind of when you want the money. You know, um, I know it, on this date my piece is going to sell. Usually, when you can sign a, a work to a dealer, you're going to sign a, a, a period of time that they have to sell the work. Granted, if you have something very desirable, you call up a dealer. You say, "Hey, do you have a buyer for this? You know, I want to net forty thousand dollars. Can you do that for me?" They say, "Sure, no problem." Um, I worked. I worked as a dealer prior to joining Christie's, um, and uh, that's where I learned about the whole auction business. And, and this is my own personal experience. Um, th there's a lot of kind of the, the pricing through private deals is sometimes arbitrary. Not really arbitrary, but everybody's kind of got their you know their 10% here, 10% there, or whatever. Um, so just be careful. I would just be cautionary when you uh, offer if you did offer something to a dealer, um, 
either um, have a contract for a certain period of time, make sure you have that so that they have six months to sell your piece. Um, you can be very specific to, to who they show it to so that they don't, because uh, sometimes if you, mar if you shop around a work of art um, too much and don't sell it, that, that's basically, you, you basically shopped it around and you, you can burn the painting, these technical terms, but uh, you can burn the painting where obviously this thing has been offered to everybody in the world and it didn't, didn't find a buyer, so now the person's bringing it to auction, everybody knows it's been shopped around, and so now you're kind of hurting the, the, the perception of the value of that, that painting. Well, why didn't anybody want this? There must be something wrong with it. So you have to be careful that way, and you can, be, you can and talk to the dealer about being specific about maybe either having first right of refusal about who they offer it to, or how many people they offer it to. Um, you say you have it for six months, but I only want to offer it to you know, four of your top clients, then I want it back. You know? um, when you set the price that, that you want for it, you can set it as a percentage of what they actually sell it for. Um, this is again with dealers, or um, you can say I want to net X amount of dollars, sell it for what you will. Be careful with that too, because you don't know actually, actually what they're gonna sell it for. And uh, I did have situations uh, when I was working as a dealer, I was, working, I was in Memphis, and um, we would, uh, we, we had a painting that we took in for sale from a client, we, had, we, we knew what their asking price was. We had our price. We, we, uh, we uh, sent it to a, another dealer for them to sell in, in the New York marketplace. And then the person selling the painting happened to go to New York, see their painting hanging in a gallery with a price tag of, of double what they were gonna net for it. And uh, you know that can, that can make someone quite unhappy. You can argue that's all legit, and that's retail market. People have got the overhead. They're gonna be able to sell it. The person's still gonna be happy because they're gonna get their the amount that they had asked for, um, so you know it's it's a different market. That's that's the, the retail dealer market than auction house. To me, I like the auction house market better. It's very transparent. It's straightforward. Things sell for what they're going to sell for. You buy something at auction, or you're selling for something at auction. You know it's selling for this price, and there's this much competition. You know if you're buying something at auction, you know someone was right behind you, uh, willing to pay, you know one increment below you. So it kind of gives you a little bit of confidence that. This piece actually has that. Um, so, yes. Well, uh, auction are a good source for that. In, in particular, areas, um, they they know the market just in and out, you know, I mean, we deal with it daily. Um, dealers, again, can be a good source of that market. Um, but, but I find people that really pay attention to that auction market are gonna have the best sense of what's going on immediately at that time. Um, and there are, there are instances, I mean, during the, the kind of contemporary art boom, um, we saw a lot of pieces coming to market because people were taking advantage of that hot market. And, and I would regularly tell clients, I said, you know what, I mean, if you're thinking about selling this painting in the next five, 10 years, I don't know if we're gonna see a better market. You know, And it's a gamble because the market could continue to keep going up. And there are instances people sell something for you know, half a million dollars and then it comes back on the market a year la later and sells for a million dollars. But you know, at the time, that half a million dollars was, was probably an extraordinary price for that, that particular work. So um, you know, then you held it, if you held it then for two years and now it's worth $250,000. You know, it's like any market. You don't know. I mean, if, if if anybody really knew, we'd all be playing the stock market, and you know, not working at all. So, um, but but you can definitely get advice as to you know, kind of what's what's strong, what markets are strong right now. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's any particularly very super strong markets. I mean, like I mentioned that micro mosaic. There was a time, three years ago, four years ago, people couldn't pay enough money for micro mosaics. I mean, I don't, you know, if it was the Middle Eastern and the Russians involved or whatever else, but any, any, I mean, I got a call from, this is when I was at Christie's, from, from our 19th century uh, furniture and decorative arts folks, like, find us micro mosaics, <laughs> you know? We put them in at five to $7,000 and we sell them for $30,000. You know, it's like, you know, go out there and find them. And so we went to the extent of putting an ad in the Houston Chronicle, like, you know, if you got a micro mosaic, now's the time to sell. So, you know, there, there's it subsets to markets where, um, uh, someone, an auction house specialist, will, will, will have a good insight to that. Um, 
and it's not always that cut and dry, and it very rarely is, but uh, but you can get a good good sense. Feel free, you can call me, and I can help you out. Too. I don't think they really dropped. It just uh, I think um, the prices uh, you could you could argue they were devalued. I don't know, but uh, there was just a lot of interest in micro mosaics. People just had a lot of quick appreciation for them, and so the prices were were building on themselves again. Um, dealers were getting involved because they knew they could sell them immediately. And then it did it did come down where uh, the, the appeal just wasn't there, I mean, for whatever reasons. Um, I don't know, you're probably a function of it's also supply and demand. You put out all for, you know, micro mosaics are hot, bring them to the market, with anything you got, then the market's flooded with them. You know, they're, they're coming out of the woodwork at that point. So it just, it just, you know, there's a lot of different components to that. Well, good. Well, thank you very much. Um, if you, yeah, I'll be, I'll be around if you want to ask me questions. Thank you.